Morning, everyone. Uh, really great to, to be here. And I want to obviously start by also adding my um, appreciation and respect to traditional owners. Um, I do most of my work on Ngunnawal and Namri country, um, so I want to particularly note their continued preservation and care for our beautiful, beautiful country. Um, and thanks, Kim, very much for inviting me um, to be part of this, this conversation and to all the, the conversation hosts. And I also want to add an apology because I am afraid I wasn't here yesterday and I can't stay for most of today because the reason I'm in Melbourne was for a different conference. Um, and, but I always am really regretful being one of those people <laughs> that comes in just for the, for the session. So I, I sort of have big pangs of regret and embarrassment because not only does it mean I've missed the tone of the discussion and I might be saying things that you completely covered yesterday and you'll be thinking, oh gosh, yeah, we've been through this. Or I'll be saying some things that are completely <laughs> off-piste and not, not particularly relevant. So huge apologies uh, in advance for that. And if there are things you want to follow up, do feel free to stay in touch. So Kim has asked me to do a, a bit of a reflection or an outline of the wellbeing economy agenda. And it's, a, it's an idea really about how to transform the economic system that's really building a head of steam, uh, getting a lot of attention in governments around the world and big sort of global movement around it with lots of different diverse component parts. And it's born of the recognition that this, I, what I'm increasingly calling sort of economic fundamentalism, is doing great damage uh, to our planet. And I don't think I need to rehearse the examples and evidence around that for this, this audience. But the way our production and consumption systems, our use of resources are pushing mother nature uh, beyond what she can handle. But it's also an economic system that is not working for enough people. Um, often you hear the term, our economy is broken. I never use that phrase because I think our economic system is doing exactly what it is designed to do and that is to channel resources up to those at the very, very top. And we're seeing so many other people completely struggling with the very basics of living. And that's resulting in ex profound despair and anxiety and community fragmentation. And we see people reaching for coping mechanisms at the pillbox and at the ballot box. Uh, and so the state our world is in, uh, not entirely, but quite substantially because of the way our economic system has been designed, purposed, delivered, who's winning and who's losing out of that, has brought us to a pretty dire, dire state. And so the wellbeing economy is basically saying if we're going to have a fighting chance of addressing those challenges, what we need to do is really fundamentally transform the economic system. And I think one of the key basics of this approach is to recognise that the economy cannot be a goal in its own right. And you'll, you'll probably remember or recognise those images of sustainable development from the 1990s where you have the three pillars, you have economy, society and environment. And I think that is one of the most dangerous images in the world because what it does is imply that the economy is on a par with society and the environment. And the very essence of the wellbeing economy agenda is really embracing what ecological economists have been saying for decades, what feminist economists have been saying for decades, and what, of course, First Nations communities around the world have been living for millennia. And that's recognising that the economy is nested within society and the two are nested within our precious natural world. And that's quite easy to say on a beautiful Friday morning in this incredible building amongst friends. But if politicians were to take that seriously, that represents quite a fundamental shifting of how we think about economic policy design, because it's basically saying we need the economy to be very deliberately in service of the higher order goals of meeting the needs of people and planet. The term wellbeing economy, I, I tend to think of it as a little bit like a picnic blanket term because you'll be all aware that there is a ton of emerging visions for how to transform the economy. And they all have their different resonance with different audiences, slightly different emphasis, whether that's donut economics or regenerative economics or alternative economics or buen vivir or solidarity economy or economy for the common good or I mentioned First Nations economic thinking or feminist economics thinking or steady state economy and so on and so on. So there's a plethora of visions out there. And the wellbeing economy is not about saying, oh, we're another one, add us to the list. And it's not about replacing or competing with those. It's almost like this picnic blanket underneath that says at their different, with their different emphasis, 
So many of those ideas have this common core idea that we have to have the economic system designed in a way to deliver what people and planet need. So working for humanity rather than the other way around. What the wellbeing economy framing also puts very deliberate emphasis on is also getting things right first time around. Because many of you, particularly if you're ecological economists, will be familiar with the term defensive expenditure. Just how much money our collective institutions or us as individuals or charities deploy in dealing with the collateral damage of the current economic system on our places and on our people. And in terms of the social policy equivalent of that, there's a term failure demand that comes from management literature from a guy called John Seddon. And it's been brought into social policy and just looking at, if you look now in the newspaper tomorrow or you read government press releases of what they're spending money on, their big announcements, so often that is driven by our collective inability to take care of people, to enable people to live the sort of lives they want to live. And so we're spending vast amounts of money, pretty inadequately often, responding to the damage that the economic system does to people and planet. And so the wellbeing economy agenda is an antidote to that. It's saying we can do better than that. We can design our economic system that makes sure people have enough, that helps people feel in control of their lives, helps people feel part of society, and that does so while protecting and cherishing our natural world. And in terms of practical way that that translates, you'll probably all be thinking, my gosh, that's a lot of changes. Uh, and you're right, from the very, very local to how we design our neighbourhoods and our transport systems, how we construct our buildings, our energy systems, uh, the nature of business models, tax systems, right up to the big supranational. And I tend to think of it as a little bit like a picnic blanket, a thousand piece picnic blanket, and all of the different component parts are all necessary but not sufficient on their own. And how I get my head around that plethora of shifts is what you do if any of you are sort of think, sorry, I said picnic blanket, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. And if you're, if you're starting a, a jigsaw puzzle, you start with the corners, yeah? So I think about this as the four Ps of the practical delivery of the wellbeing economy agenda. And rather conveniently, they all start with P. So they're about purpose, prevention, pre-distribution, and people-powered. So purpose is essentially doing what I've been describing, is really recognising the economy cannot be a goal in its own right. It is about the mechanism to serve our higher order goals. So it's about getting clear on the means and ends. And so often when you hear talk about the economy, it's just grow the economy, assuming that that will automatically translate to good lives. But this is about saying what we need to do is think about what is it we need more of in our society because particular activities are behavior and behaviours are aligned to what people and planet need? And what if we're really honest, do we need to power down because they're doing damage to our human and ecological systems? And so things like the recent government's measuring what matters statements, it is a step in the right direction, starting to think about the goals of government and the purpose of government. Pro-social business models would be another example of the sorts of things you'd see in that corner of the jigsaw puzzle. Prevention is about saying it's not good enough just to constantly be spending on failure demand and defensive expenditure. What we need to do is stop playing whack-a-mole and going crisis to crisis, but look upstream at the machine that connects those things and take action there. So the more circular our production and consumption systems, the fewer beach cleanups we'll need. The more renewable our energy systems, the less we'll be having to spend on carbon capture, sequestration and storage. The more jobs pay people enough to live on, the less governments will be having to spend on emergency shelters and rent assistance. The more those jobs give people a sense of dignity and purpose, the less our GPs will be writing anti-anxiety treatments. So you get the points. It's about moving upstream, looking at the causes, not just spending reactively downstream after the fact. The next P is pre-distribution. And this is about saying, yes, redistribution through taxes and transfers is important, but it's a hell of a lift. The Australian government reduces economic inequality through taxes and welfare payments by about a third, which to me seems like a big effort for government. And you'll all be familiar with the pretty fraught conversations about increasing taxes in Australia, and let alone the stigmatisation around welfare conversations. And so pre-distribution is saying, how can we ask 
the economy to do more of the heavy lifting in delivering the sort of outcomes that people and planet need. So the sort of pieces of the jigsaw puzzle you'd see in this corner would be things like worker cooperatives, where you have labour owning the capital, true cost accounting, so we're properly taking account of the environmental or social impact, things like community wealth building, where you're generating economic activity from the community up, rather than waiting and crossing our fingers for trickle down. And then the final P is people powered. And this is really making sure that people and communities feel at the forefront of these changes, whether that's through economic democracy or participatory budgeting or citizens assemblies, where people feel that their views are at the forefront of economic thinking. And so at the heart of the wellbeing economy agenda is a different mindset. It's about really thinking through how we think about the role of nature because how we think about nature, of course, informs how we act towards nature. And I just want to very, very quickly race through a couple of pieces of that jigsaw puzzle that to me feel really pertinent to the framing and our mindsets and our attitudes towards nature. And I've mentioned already the circular economy. And I think the approach of the circular economy at its best is moving beyond an extraction approach. It's moving beyond taking more than we give. We see the growing conversations around the simple life, people very deliberately trying to tread more lightly on the earth. Uh, we, of course, see growing conversations ar and around regenerative agriculture when it's done well. It's really about bringing in a lot of traditional farming techniques, again, so that we're ta inherently taking care of our soils and our waterways and our land. We see the growing rights of nature movement, um, other legal activities and corporate activities where elevating the position of nature in our thinking. So if some examples of that, of course, you'll probably all be aware of the New Zealand River. I'm not even going to try and pronounce it because I'll mangle it. But a couple of years ago, the third longest river in New Zealand uh, was, had guardians appointed to take care of it. Uh, similarly, in India, the Ganges and the Yamara um, River by the High Court were given legal status equivalent to a person to stop pollution. We see Ecuador putting rights of nature in the Constitution. Uh, we see companies like Faith in Nature, which are a huge UK shampoo, shower gel, soap company, uh, saying, pointing on their board someone whose job it is to represent nature. So sitting around the board table is someone whose voice is speaking up for nature. You see places like Pittsburgh banning natural gas extraction, not because of health reasons, but although that's important, but because of nature's inalienable right um, to exist and to flourish. We're also seeing, and I think this is a really exciting movement, around use of the legal system and court actions. And at last count, around the world, there are about 2,000 different court actions uh, pending, whether that's over misleading claims by, from companies, whether it's companies or countries not adhering to climate change um, legislation or environmental, sort of ignoring environmental legislation, or failure to reduce CO2 emissions. And so you see places like the governor of California suing big oil companies for damage to the environment. You see the ICC starting to elevate the role of environmental damage in what it will take action on. Uh, you see, of course, in Australia, recent court cases led by young people, um, where they're saying we need to recognise the economic, the risk to the economy and things like government bonds because of environmental extraction. And just a few weeks ago in Montana, again, led by young people, a court finding that the Montana constitution that says people have a right to a healthy environment needs to be upheld and legislation needs to, needs to follow that. We also see emerging approaches to taking care of common assets, and famously places like Alaska or Shetland. Uh, Vermont has a really great one where they see air and water as common and need and common assets for people in Vermont. And so they've protected them using user fees. So when people are drawing down on air through pollution or taking from the water wells, creating the, those fees to create a common fund to then redeploy to protect uh, those assets. Uh, you see places like Kenya, where they're using public participation, mapping of ecosystems um, to better manage water and sanitation in some of their slums. Um, and of course, this really goes to the heart of sort of Eleanor Ostrom's work, where she says we don't need to be you know, captured by Garrett ha um, ha Anderson's ca sort of tragedy of the commons. Actually, when people come together under particular circumstances, they are very good 
collectively at taking care of their common resources. And finally, I think what's really important is these merging conversations around just the inherent value of nature. And the wonderful organisation Climate Laws puts, has got on their website where they sort of list the different elements of value that nature brings alongside economic, but it's ecological value, cultural values, religious values, aesthetic values. And I think what's key about that conversation is it really names how the economic value is important, but it's only one dimension. And therefore, price can only be one single signal <coughs> that we listen to. And so I guess my question to you and what I'm really looking forward to hearing is coming out of today's session and yesterday's session is how do we broaden what signals we're listening to? How do we broaden what we're hearing, what we're t tracking, and how we're evaluating success uh, beyond price and economic conversations? So thank you so much, and thanks again for having me.